First up is Brett Freilich of the University of North Carolina Institute for Marine Sciences. Uh, his team, UNC, is also joined by UNC Charlotte and the Marine Biotechnology Center of Innovation. Uh, Brett personally is passionate about his science and particularly connecting his science to the people it impacts the most on the coast, so you'll see a little bit more about that. He has some unique strategies for connecting to uh, those coastal folks, those fishermen and boaters. He's uh, actually partnered with a few restaurants and bars in the coastal area to host technical talks. So he's able to go and uh, make a, have a discussion on oysters and just really engage with those boaters and fishermen and show them how the science can really uh, bring some impact to what they're doing every day. So there's a short-term benefit. Uh, I guess one of those bars has offered a free cocktail to the first 50 who've come but certainly long-term benefits in those stronger relationships. Uh, I also learned Brent is the only person that I know to ever visit, what is it, the all North Carolina natural, national history sites? All national park system. National park system sites in North Carolina, and that's a lot. Um, and South Carolina too, by the way. So he's a really interesting guy, and you guys will enjoy talking to him. Brett, come on up. Hello, thank you. So I wanna tell you a little bit about how I got here. And I've lived in a lot of places in North Carolina. I've lived in Raleigh and Durham, uh, Greensboro, Winston-Salem, and in Charlotte. Charlotte's where I got my PhD, and that's where I began doing coastal and seafood microbiology research. It's quite a, quite a trek doing research in Charlotte on the coast, and you're five hours from the coast. So after being there for a while, I actually moved out to Moorhead City, North Carolina. And there I've been for the last four years continuing that coastal and seafood microbiology research. Although this time, the research is in my own backyard. I'm now a professor at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill and working at the Institute of Marine Science. It's a nice place to uh, live and to work. Uh, we have wonderful beaches. Of course, the Outer Banks is right there. Uh, we have a national forest. It's wonderful to camp in. We have a seafood festival that brings 50,000 people to our little part of the state. And of course, we get to enjoy that seafood year round. We have fresh shrimp, fresh clams, fresh fish, and fresh local salty oysters. I actually brought a few of those oysters with me today, and if you don't mind, I might actually have one. What kind of seafood scientist would I be if I didn't always carry around my oyster knife? Uh, I'm gonna have to put down the mic here for a minute, but I'm gonna try to shout as loud as I can. So look at this sucker, isn't it beautiful? Right from our own watery backyard. So actually, uh, the award-winning author, Rowan Jacobson, who went from coast to coast, state to state, and wrote a book on oysters where he sampled them from every place in the United States that had them, stood right here on this stage, and he called North Carolina the Napa Valley of oysters. Uh, he said our water quality, combined with our unique taste, led him to that conclusion. If you'll excuse me just a moment. I'm gonna to have to agree with you. <laughs> they are pretty good. But there's a risk that comes with eating raw oysters. Some oysters can have a bacteria in them that can make you very, very sick. See, the bacteria live in the water and the oysters pump the water over their gills. So the bacteria get into the oysters and if you eat those oysters, they can get into you. Uh, for example, there was a man in his 50s, enjoyed some oysters with his family, uh, went home, went to bed. The next day he woke up, he was short of breath, uh, very high fever, diarrhea, and his leg was hurting him very bad. His family convinced him that he should go to the ER. It's a good thing he did. When he got there, the doctors could clearly see his leg was infected. At this point, it was red and swollen, and had actually begun to get ulcers on it. So they admitted him to the hospital. They gave him intravenous antibiotics to try to get rid of the infection and kept him under observation for two days. His fever never went down once. On that third day, he started to complain. 
His leg was starting to go numb, and it was starting to turn dark. They moved him to intensive care. His breathing got so shallow, they had to put in a breathing tube. And his leg, all those ulcers, started to get bigger. His leg started to turn black. The flesh was dying, and that infection was spreading fast. Those doctors knew they needed to act and act immediately to try to save his life. Their only option was to cut off his leg and do it now. This is actually a really typical story for people who get infections from these types of bacteria from eating oysters. And unfortunately, what is also typical is that man still lost his life. Now, that's a grim story and one that everybody who eats seafood should understand. But I don't want to over-alarm you. Typically, you have to have some sort of condition that puts you at risk for these infections. Those anybody, uh, that includes anybody with uh, liver problems, such as those with cirrhosis or alcoholism or hepatitis. But it also includes people whose immune systems are uh, Im impaired, such as those with HIV, people undergoing cancer treatments, diabetics. It still puts a lot of people at risk. And so while these infections are generally rare, they are increasing worldwide. And actually, the bacteria are increasing as well. This is an example of our work. It's covering about a decade. And there's really two things I want you to take away from here. One is you can see the bacteria are having this upward trend. But the other thing is notice that there's this up and down bounce that goes with them. You see, these bacteria undergo a cycle. And there are times when they are really high, and there are times when they're fairly low. Now, if we look closer, so instead of looking at an entire decade, we're looking at just one year, you can see here that there's still kind of a trend, but now it's harder to tell the pattern. There are still times when they are really high and still times when they're really low, but it's not seasonal. We don't really know what's causing this. But imagine this. My dad loves to come from High Point and visit me out in Moorhead City. When you live five minutes from the beach, you have a lot of friends that love to come visit you. So he comes to visit me, and the first thing he wants to do when he gets there is eat seafood. In fact, I think it's half the reason he comes to visit me as often as he does. So he gets out of the car and says, today's a good day to eat some oysters. It's my dad voice. And I used to agree with him, but my dad is diabetic, and knowing what I know and the research that I do, I've had to tell him, no, he cannot eat these local salty oysters that he loves so much. But think about this. What if there was a way for, we, for us to know whether it was a day where we might have a high number of bacteria or a day where there were a low number of bacteria in those oysters? Now, while I would always want him to be careful, if I knew that the oysters that day had a really low number, I wouldn't feel so bad. I'd actually say, OK, Dad, let's split two dozen oysters with cocktail sauce. That's the way he likes them and I wouldn't have to worry. Well, we actually can test for that. We can know, I mean, that's how we got these numbers here, what's in those oysters. But that test takes quite a while, as we have to wait for these bacteria to grow up. By that time, the chance to eat those oysters has come and gone. There are faster tests available, but they're not very accurate. And in fact, they don't give us a good idea of whether those bacteria in there are actually the kind that can make you sick. It's like this. The way researchers currently tackle the problem now is they look at all the people that have gotten infections and then look at the bacteria that have made them sick and try to find something in common. Maybe all the bacteria had a particular type of toxin. Then what they do is they make a test that looks for that one toxin, and that's it. And if it has a toxin, they declare it as something that can make you sick. But that's really an odd way of doing it. Think about crime for a minute. What if we wanted to catch all the muggers that are out there? And we look at all the muggings that happen and say, you know what, a lot of times muggers have a knife when they're mugging somebody. So we tell the police, all right, arrest everybody with a knife. But you see the problem here. Sometimes people with knives are just cutting birthday cakes or eating dinner or opening an oyster. And they're going to get arrested and they didn't do anything wrong. And in testing, we call those false positives. And then sometimes people are going to commit muggings, but they're not going to use a knife. They might use a gun or a baseball bat or nothing at all. But we've only told the police to look for people with knives. 
So those people are going to get away. And in testing, we call those false negatives. So that's what our team is working on. And I can't stress how much of a team effort this is. Uh, as in the introduction, it's multi-institutional, uh, multidisciplinary, and really a fantastic team. And I want to highlight uh, Dr. Rachel Noble, who couldn't be here today, who's really spearheaded the entire project and is our group leader. So what are we actually looking at? Well, what if we could pick up, think of a different way of trying to figure out the crime? Instead of looking at what weapon they might be holding when they were doing it, what if we could find something in their background that we could identify? Maybe all the potential muggers might have gang activity or they might have uh, a criminal record. Well, we can do that with the bacteria too. What we do is we look at their entire genome, their entire set of DNA, and we can figure out their genetic history, their genetic background. And instead of looking for one thing that might make people sick, we look at everything all at once. So that way it doesn't matter whether that bacterium is wielding a knife or a baseball bat or something we don't even know exists yet. We can figure it out. What we do is we compare bacteria from, that have made people sick versus ones that haven't made people sick. And we compare their genomes. But using computer, we can make those comparisons a million times a second until eventually we can come up with a fingerprint, a fingerprint that identifies only those that are going to make you sick. Using that fingerprint, we can make a test that is incredibly accurate and is very fast, so that you could have the oysters pulled out of the water in the morning, test a few of them, and know by lunch whether they're safe or not. That way, I could take my dad to his favorite waterfront restaurant, if I knew the number of bacteria were low that particular day, I could look at my dad and say, yes, you are right, today is a great day to eat oysters. <laughs>